Good afternoon. My name is Reverend Dr. Rodney Sadler, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Dangerous Dialogues. This is our first opportunity to do a dangerous dialogue in the middle of the day. So uh, if you're with us today, we're incredibly appreciative of your ability to join us. We're particularly happy to have this one in the middle of the day because of the topic. We are able to be joined today by guests from on the ground in Palestine uh, and able to get their perspective uh, first and foremost. Uh, and I think the last time that we had a conversation like this, we had a conversation with uh, Ali Abu Awad and he was awake at 2.30 in the morning. So uh, I think that this timing works a whole lot better than that last timing did. So thank you for joining us at this point in time. And we are pleased to have you with us for this important conversation. This conversation today is a partnership between the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation of Union Presbyterian Seminary and the Friends of Tahir. Uh, we hope that we will expand these Friends of Tahir as we continue these dialogues as we go forward. I wanna to start today before I introduce our guests by making a confession. I started off as a American Christian Zionist. When I uh, grew up, I was raised in a Quaker school, had a great opportunity to learn about a good balanced information about Israel, Palestine, the coming to be of these nations. And I remember the first time I made a trip to the land uh, that we call Holy in 1990. I was going to study at Hebrew University, going to study the America and Holy Lands project. I remembered I stayed in a apartment complex on Mount Scopus. I had a great time there. I enjoyed my interactions with all the people that were there, Israelis and Palestinians. I noted that the Americans were often found it difficult to walk through Silwan, uh, the neighborhood that's named for the Pool of Siloam uh, in the Bible, this neighborhood that's right around the, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. I would walk back and forth through there with no problem and had great relations with my Palestinian uh, brothers and sisters there. But my Jewish siblings and my white American siblings did not have such ease. I remember one day though, coming home to my apartment and I opened the door and as I walked in, I was confronted by a man standing there with a knife in his hand. He had a steak knife and he was holding it on me. He just walked out of my room. <clears throat> I knew he was there to rob me. I sort of looked at him and he held up the knife. And I remember, I think I kind of chuckled under my, my, my voice there. I sort of chuckled a little bit. Uh, laughing and you know he's like you know why are you laughing I got a knife on you and I'm like dude I'm from Camden New Jersey uh, that's not a knife uh, that scene from uh, uh, from uh, the, the 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 movie with uh, Crocodile Dundee that comes out that's not a knife um, and I remember I think taking the knife from him and as I waited my roommate came in my roommate was a six foot two inch African American police former police officer from D.C. I was like, the two of us, there's nothing that we need to fear. Uh, we grabbed him, we uh, escorted him out of our apartment, took the knife from him, uh, he was on his way. And it was later on that day that uh, my roommate came back. My roommate was a man named Ben. He was uh, just out of the Israeli Defense Force uh, and had started college at Hebrew University. And we told him what had happened. We told him about the encounter and he says, oh, I know who that is. Uh, he's a Palestinian man who lives right down the street here. I was like, well, whoever he was, he seemed crazy. He came in here with a knife and he was going to rob our stuff. And, and he said, don't judge him too harshly. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, think about this. The land that you're standing on, the land that all of these apartments on Mount Scopus are sitting on, the land that the Hyatt across the street is sitting on, the land that the Hadassah Hospital right down the road is sitting on, all used to belong to this man's family. This was all his land. He said, maybe you would be a little bit crazy if someone took all of your land away from you and left you on a little corner to watch what's going on around you. And it really struck me hard. I 
thought back to my indigenous American ancestors who lost the land of the United States of America. I thought about my African-American ancestors snatched from their land, brought here and forced to live in slavery as second class citizens in a nation where they were born and could only imagine what this man's life must have been like. You see, it was in that moment, uh, the hearing of a different story that my mind set changed, that I became uh, awakened in a new way to reality. We can learn a lot by listening to people's stories. That's really what I want us to be able to accomplish today. I want us to begin to hear the stories of people that are often not told, hear the stories of people that have often been silenced. Let's hear these stories as though for the first time. And as we do so today, I'm hoping that we will be able to get a different sense of perspective, a different understanding of reality, maybe a more true sense of what is really going on in this world we think we know so very well. Let's supplement the narratives we think we know so well by hearing some new stories today. I wanna start off by introducing our panel today. First, I wanna introduce you to uh, Ali Abu Awad, the founder of the uh, Tahir movement uh, and the manager of this larger organization. He's gonna to talk to you from on the ground in Bethlehem, as well as Siham Fayyad, who will speak to you. Uh, she's a woman's leadership activist in Palestine. She'll speak to you from her situation in uh, Jericho, as will Emily uh, Rashwami, who is also working at Tahir uh, in, uh, as the communications director from Bethlehem. We'll first hear from uh, Ali, and then I'll open up the conversation to move a little further. Ali, uh, please share with us what's on your heart today. Thank you, my dear. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues who are here today and everyone who's listening to us. Uh, yes, that's me, Ali Abawad. I'm a Palestinian nonviolence activist. Um, I was born in this uh, tough reality, uh, and I was born to a very political mother, actually. My mother joined PLO since the 17th. She served years in the Israeli prison because of her activities against the Israeli occupation. And even my childhood was connected to politics because uh, we, we ate politics, we breathed politics, Every, everything was about politics because of my mother. And um, I opened my eyes and I saw my mother was beaten in front of me when I was 10 years old by the Israeli soldiers and security officers. And it didn't take me a minute to just try to find a chance to take revenge. And when the first Palestinian uprising, the first massive uh, Intifada started in 1987. I became a young Fatah activist. Uh, Fatah is part or the biggest party of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. And then I end to be in prison for, uh, for four years. And then my first encounter actually with nonviolence was in prison because me and my mother was in, in, in the same period of time were present in different uh, prisons. So I wanted to see her, always I wanted to see her. I was just 18 years old and Israel has refused for us to meet. So after three years of asking and then I gave up, then I, me and her decided to go for a hunger strike to see each other. This hunger strike uh, took place in 1993 and it continued for 17 days of starving. And after 17 days, uh, the, uh, you know, the Israeli jailers came and said, okay, you can eat, you can see your mother. And I said, I don't trust you. I wanna see my mother first. Then they said, you have to move. You will not be able to move if you don't eat something. Then the Red Cross and the whole story, because you know, we don't trust each other here. So I went to meet her 
And from the first minute I just saw her in her other prison, I felt a great celebration of winning. I have never achieved or succeed to achieve something from Israel. But with my weaknesses, with my empty stomach, I could achieve and force even all of this military system to accept my rights. So I came back to my prison, very inspired, very moved, uh, full of love to my mother, to very, very, very proud of myself as a child. I was a big child. And then I start learning about nonviolence and nonviolence leaders around the world. Uh, then to make a long, long story short, I was released with my mother by the signing of Oslo Peace Initiative in 1994. And I tried to connect myself to a system on the ground, but I couldn't because I, even with the Peace Initiative, I was struggling. Who, who, who am I? What is my role here? Is it to keep this peace process alive? But how can we keep this process alive as long as there is the occupation on the ground, settlements are growing, checkpoints. So we couldn't experience what does it mean to have a dignified peace. On the other hand, we couldn't really become citizens of a state. So we become so confused, are we part of revolution or we are citizens of a state? Neither this or that. Finally, the peace process has collapsed. Our dream collapsed. I wanted to live in peace, but I couldn't really live peacefully. So in 2000, I was badly wounded by a settler. And while I was having my medical treatment in Saudi Arabia, because they sent me there because of my heart case and my knee, I received the news that uh, a group of Israeli soldiers has stopped my older brother Yusuf, 31 years old, and very violently killed him. So when this happened to someone, and I wish that will never happen to anyone, you're not the same person, it's not the same life. These are not the same enemies that you, 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 you used to deal with, but the price now is much higher than land, than anything else. Uh, I promise you, I will do everything possible just to hug him again. Nothing worth such a price, not land, not identity, nothing. But he's gone and he's gone. He will never be, be back. So what kind of justice that I want? I mean, the only justice in my eyes is to have him back. This is just solution. And from that minute, I start giving up believing in just solutions. But I also believe in fair solutions. On the other hand, I couldn't take revenge. I'm a human being. Yes, I used to fight the occupation. I hold a Kalashnikov when I was 15 years old. But now it's not the same story. I was inspired by nonviolence. I practice nonviolence. I have never been to university. Even my English came from prison. My Hebrew came from prison. And I, I was struggling between this desire of revenge in a way, or, or shall I give up? Then one day I met a group of Israeli parents who came to our home and a group of parents who have lost someone in the conflict. And they sit in my home, my, invite, my mother invited them because she received a, a phone call from them. And I remember they sat there and they said, they know exactly what does it mean to lose, to lose someone, but they don't know what does it mean to live under occupation, under someone control. And even with the price that they paid, they stand for us, they stand with us to have our freedom and dignity. And they will not allow any governmental or political system to use their loss by killing someone, by controlling someone. I was totally moved. Honestly, that was the first time I sit with a Jewish person with tears in her eyes or his eyes. 
I grow up with a belief that Jewish people have no tears. They don't know what feelings, human feeling means. So my life has changed. I become an activist, a leader in nonviolence and reconciliation. And I realized that I'm not the only victim on, on earth. I could see my enemy as human being. And then one of part of my philosophy is not about that nonviolence is to be able to show your enemy how human you are. It's not about your humanity or just your humanity. Actually, my real weapon in this struggle is the humanity of my enemy. And I have to be able to bring them to that level. I created joint initiatives, peace dialogues. I traveled the whole world with this story. But finally, I came back five years ago and I said, nonviolence also is not just about hummus and hugs when we meet Israelis and we love each other. Nonviolence is much more than that. I want to create a dignified identity of nonviolence for my own people, not necessarily to work, to work with my enemies, but at least to start building a responsible society that will stand for freedom and deal with the confusion of the fighting identity or the citizenship identity. So me and community leaders here in Palestine created Taghir, which names change. And all what we do is about changing this relation of this land from a relation between of, of, of all ownership to a relation of belonging. On the other hand, and this is the last thing that I wanna say, this conflict, in my opinion, is about behaviors and it should be about behaviors, not identity. We should not force anyone to change his or her identity, but we definitely should, should help everyone to change their behavior. Occupation is behavior, not violence is behavior. So if we accept each other identities, I think peace for me is this place where these two identities or more can be practiced in a fashion of dignity that guarantee every side right. Any politician will frame this in an agreement, he will be my hero. Amen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate every time I get a chance to hear from you, Ali. Thank you for your wonderful story, the witness that you live uh, this nonviolence, which is your way of life, your, your faith, as it were. Uh, and I'm grateful to see uh, that manifest. I want to turn right now and ask uh, Siham, uh, just, just, uh, just introduce yourself to us for a moment. Tell us a little bit about uh, what your life is like on a regular basis. Uh, and I'll come back to some deeper questions later, but I just want to get introduced to you and then I want to bring Emily into the conversation. Tell us a little bit about your life. Well, my life is not as glamorous and as dramatic as Ali's, <laughs> but uh, I lived a, a kind of a sheltered life by my father. My father uh, suffered during the last war, the 67. So after that, he moved to Jericho from Gaza and we lived in a community much like the, what is known, known as the kibbutz, but it was a Palestinian community. And we lived all our lives there, almost on the border of Jordan. And we had nothing to do with politics all our lives. Yeah, I mean, growing up as teenagers. And the only thing I was taught by my father was to judge humans based on their humanity, regardless of color, origin, nationality, or anything. It's how you treat others and yeah, expect others to treat you. This is how you live your life. And I think for me, nonviolent action or nonviolence as, as an option was something that was ingrained and built up as a sense of value rather than a transformation like what happened with Ali. And I think this is something to be looked at now because not all of the people here now with the new generations, they have not lived the whole first intifada, second in, people changed and it became more of a systemic, systemic uh, uh, conflict rather than uh, two nations or two people fighting for, 
uh, land. And I just have to maybe um, a bit comment on what Ali said about the two stories or the two sides of the story. I think because of our identity being connected to stories, the narratives, and because these two narratives are somewhat contradicting and threatening to the other, this is why we find it really hard to accept and tolerate the other perspective. And I think politicians instead, or leaderships in general, instead of uh, working to fix that or to work with that, they use this, they feed the fear of the other, dehumanize the other in order to keep you know, all the dynamics going because, well, it works well for them, for the elites. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm Bedouin of origin. So I, I'm actually, for me, Palestine is more of a notion than a nation. And this is why it's so connecting to people in diaspora and in, in, in the West Bank, in Gaza, even though we're disconnected geographically and with borders and with, with, with the wall, but we're still having this notion putting us together. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Zahan. Uh, Emily, just want to uh, start off with you with that same question. I just want to say thank you, Siham, for that notion, uh, that notion of a notion, not a nation. I'm going to ponder that for a while. Thank you. Emily, tell us a little bit about yourself, your life, your background. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Rishmawi. I'm from Beit Sahur, uh, which is just one kilometer from Bethlehem. Beit Sahur is the shepherd's field uh, for those who have been in Palestine. And I'm a Christian Palestinian, and I like to highlight that because I like to say to the world that yes, there are Christians in Palestine and we are still there. And we come from the roots of Jesus, although we are like less than 1%, but we are here and we are staying. <laughs> I joined the Tarir movement uh, recently because I believe in change, which is Tarir. I believe in the power of youth and that youth like us, we are the leaders of the future. So we're gonna bring this change. So we have to stick to this land to lead it to that change. I did not, I, like, I was not raised in a political family or this is what I thought, like I could be not politicized until I studied public policies and political action in France. And my final research was about politicization and depoliticization of the Palestinian youth. And this is when I discovered or just it was exposed to the notion of politicize and I discovered that you cannot be a Palestinian and not have a Palestinian opinion or an opinion about what's all um, going on in, uh, in Palestine. So we're all politicized in some way. Um, but anyways, I um, beside being a part of the Tarir movement, I'm also a tour guide. And this is the way of my uh, nonviolence resistance. I like to present my country in a nice way because tourists who come to this country, uh, they trust their tour guide and I'll be the first ambassador that they see from Palestine. And this is my nonviolence way of showing the world what is Palestinians. Emily, thank you. thank you so much. I really appreciate not just your story, your testimony, but now that I also know that I can find a tour guide when I go back again. So uh, I will take you up on those services uh, next time I'm in the, in the country. Uh, but thank you for sharing that and that, that, that important notion that there's no way to be Palestinian without having some sense of uh, involvement in this larger issue, this larger struggle. Uh, I wanna talk about the fact that Palestinian identity today is not just uh, held by those people who are Palestinian who still live in that land. We also have Palestinians who live in the diaspora today. I wanna to introduce you to two such people. I wanna introduce you to Rowan O'Day, who's the co-director of New Story Leadership. And she's gonna talk about uh, her work and some of the things that she does to help tell a different story uh, within this country, bringing people together. Then also I wanna introduce you to Tafik Hakim, uh, who's the founder uh, of the Foundation for Self-Leadership. Excited to have him with us and have him talk about how he uses his technological skills as well uh, to the advantage of this larger movement. So let's start off with you, Rowan. Tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about uh, what is it like to be a Palestinian in diaspora? What is it like to grow up uh, with that identity? 
Thank you, Rodney. And thank you to everyone that's joining us. My name is Rowan. I'm a Palestinian American. Um, yeah, I guess to, to kind of connect you to my story and how I came to be where I am today. Um, my family is from Hawara. It's a village in Area C of the West Bank, very conservative, and it's like connected through agriculture um, and farming and olive trees. Um, my parents got the opportunity to immigrate to the United States through like a series of like green card chains in the early 90s, where it was a lot easier than today. So uh, we moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, the real Brooklyn, I will say, not the Williamsburg. I mean, Williamsburg is Brooklyn, but I mean like hardcore Brooklyn, like very diverse community. And um, growing up there, I was the only Arab girl in school. Um, I remember after the tragedy of 9-11, everything switched. It felt like the entire country was looking at me and my family with a microscope. My mother wore a headscarf. Um, and we were targeted, we were called terrorists, we were asked like, why are we here? Why do we want to kill Americans? And at the time, I too was an American. Um, and it really, it really pushed me away almost from wanting to like, embrace my identity as a Palestinian. And on top of that, you know, my parents were scared to be political, to voice any kind of concern. So we didn't talk about Palestine in my house much um, or politics. I remember in our like one bedroom, we had a TV, two TVs, like an Arabic satellite TV and an American TV. And we would like turn on the American t news channel and we would see like, you know, President Bush is launching a war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then I would turn on the um, Arabic satellite and then Al Jazeera will talk about like the number of civilians that were already killed. And so that's kind of how I grew up kind of confused about like, what does this all mean? And who am I? And, uh, what's my role in this? And my parents saw that, like they saw the confusion that Ali was speaking about. So it's interesting, we both had that experience in Palestine and in the USA. And so they were like, okay, we're gonna move back to Palestine. I was 15 at the time. All I knew was the USA. And I was like heartbroken because I was like, oh, I have to break up with my like secret boyfriend now. And like, what about prom? And like, I had all these plans. And now my parents are like, we're gonna take you to Hawada. And when they broke the news, my uncle was like, crying he had lived with us he was like the fun uncle and I was like why are you crying like your world isn't ending you don't have to like say goodbye to all your friends and that's when he said that he can't go back he lost the right to go back to Palestine um because he left before 1967 and he hasn't been able to get to get the papers to return home and he went on and on about us being the only family that he really was able to connect to. And us leaving meant that he was alone. And that's when it kind of hit me that there's something a lot deeper than just, we're just going back to Palestine. And when we did, um, it was a completely different world. I cannot tell you the feeling of like going through our village and my grandmother doing the Zagrute I'm not gonna do it now. I might, do, yeah, I'm not gonna do it now. Um, but it's basically like this sound of like celebration that you're coming home and an Israeli Jeep and Israeli soldiers right next door kind of like looking at us. And I thought this, this, is, this is our new normal. Um, and so with my Palestinian identity, it felt like I was hiding it for so long, trying to assimilate to a country that was telling me that I didn't belong and now being, when I moved to Palestine, I was confronted by it and I had the additional American element. So I could speak to the soldiers in English and be like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, you're not supposed to be on my rooftop. Um, and they would like be shocked or like, oh my God, a Palestinian that can speak English. And so throughout um, my time there, I, I felt like I was also, my Palestinian community looked at me as the American girl 
And I'd be like, you know, you don't understand. You weren't here during the second intifada. You don't know what how hard it is. And I kind of felt like I still want to have a voice and say. And it wasn't until I saw my brother arrested during Eid al-Adha. Um, he was playing outside. There was clashes that were happening a few miles away at Zatara checkpoint. And the IDF decided to arrest every kid on the street, man and boy. And when, when I saw them like taking him away, I like ran downstairs and I was like, you can't arrest him. He's an American citizen. And then I thought to myself, what an absurd way to justify or to try to protect my brother by using a nationality rather than the fact that he was just a child being handcuffed and taken away. And the days after that um, incident, I like Googled the news and I was like, Where, why is the media not reporting on this? What is the American government doing? And then I thought to myself, actually, what am I doing about it? Like, where's my voice in, in talking about this? And when I started telling my friends, like, why let's like do protests, like, let's talk about it. Let's try to get media coverage. Everyone was like afraid. And that's when I realized that Palestinians and the younger generation, we are often conditioned to not want to speak up, to kind of just stand by. And, and, um, and so that's when I found New Story Leadership, the organization I now run. It's a program that brings Israelis and Palestinians to work on Capitol Hill and trains them how to use their voice, how to use their story. And I think that's really what it comes down to for me is like empowerment and taking a stand and speaking up, especially in the United States because of the huge role that the US plays in our conflict. Um, so I think I'll end there. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your story, Ruan. I really appreciate uh, all the, the intimate details of it. And I want to follow up with it. Uh, when I get to this, the question, I, after after we hear from Tufik, the question I want to uh, ask everybody, I want to hear you uh, in particular wrestle with. Uh, Tufik, tell us a little bit about your story. Thank you, Rodney. And uh, lovely to be on this uh, little conversation with my colleagues from Palestine and, and in DC. And thank you all for joining. My story is a little different from the rest and in many ways similar. Um, I'm probably the only one in this group who have not been to Palestine and I'm there with it constantly in my heart and soul. My story is a little different you see because I grew up Lebanese with the closeted Palestinian inside. Molded by the pride of Lebanon as a father and the gentleness of Palestine as a mother. And my story, like yours, in some ways, maybe more implicit than yours, contains in it images of suffering, resilience, and hope. It, in some ways, has in it some yearning for a dream that was cut short. A, a, a yearning for a loving relationship with the land between the sea and the river that was never allowed to flourish. There is pain from the imposed separation, violation, and forced surrender. My story goes back two generations when a grandfather and a grandmother had to leave Jaffa in 1948 in a jiffy. Jaffa is where Tel Aviv is today, a port city with deep history. They left behind decades of hard work, a small young business, a uh, cozy property, dreams unfulfilled, memories frozen. They looked back for a moment knowing they're not gonna come back dragged with them three children, among them my 16-year-old, much later to be mother, and went north. They were the privileged ones. And they promised each other then never to show their pain in public. 
and they never did. Don't you hate stubbornness? And you know, they kept that pain inside. It must have eaten them up. And they wore instead the smile of gratitude, acceptance, compassion, and love. They never let cynicism or rancor set in. They baked gentleness and kindness in their bread in how they raised their family and built their values. From deep pain, deep love. This was the Palestine that was seeded inside of me. And as I look back, I realize there were really two instances that challenged that Palestinian inside of me. And they both went back to the Lebanese civil war. The first one at the beginning of the war, there was some clashes between an armed Lebanese faction and armed Palestinians in the refugee camps down the hill from where I lived. I lived on a hill in a middle-class household and they, my neighboring Palestinians in refugee camps. Their movements stifled, their futures crushed, their dignities pulverized. They were maltreated, abused, harassed, and they had to be on the move again. And I, the Palestinian inside of me, hopeless, helpless, anger, and indignation filled, filled my soul. And yet my sweet mother would talk to me about patience and hope and how through the pain, we can get to the other side. She was feeding the Palestinian in me. And the second instance actually was a few years later when another Lebanese faction, and I'm really ashamed and embarrassed to even admit it, declared a statement that every Lebanese must kill a Palestinian and graffitied this on every wall they could find. Kill, ouch, against my grain. Kill a Palestinian, double ouch, with the Palestinian DNA running through my soul. And we were nervous that, you know, if my mom would open her mouth, she'd give herself away with a very thick Palestinian accent. She, on the other hand, had no fear because she believed that fear would breed violence if not overcome. And violence comes from hatred if it's not doused. And to her, this was against her grain. Yes. That was her way to feed the Palestinian in me and, and insist that nonviolence and peace are the only way to go. And we talk about freedom. Shouldn't people fight for survival, for their land, for their destiny and dignity? Mm -hmm. And she would say, freedom doesn't come from the outside. Freedom lives in us and you get to it from the palm of your hand. Some people use their hand to slap and kill. I want us to use our hands to pray and comfort others. That was the Palestine I knew inside of me. Thank you. And as a teenage boy growing up in Beirut, I had to reconcile between that Palestinian inside of me and the Palestine I would see on TV detached. And I wanted to honor the pain that my parents, my mother in particular, and my grandparents experienced and that devoured them. And I wanted to honor their way of living for peace, where peace is not about giving in or giving up. It's about learning to live through the conflict, honor the humanity in the other, like Ali was saying earlier, and believing that we can get through it stronger and whole on the other side. And having lived in an apolitical home throughout my years in Lebanon, I was not allowed to share an opinion, kind of like Rawan in a way. Mm -hmm. 
couldn't, couldn't express myself as a Palestinian, did not know what that meant. And I obliged and I played, played that game until that is when I came to the US, when I started to find my voice. And there were a lot of stories since then and I'm still emerging, you know, from that closeted Palestinian, trying to find my voice and trying to commit to a, a, a life of justice and peace to honor my grandparents, to help bring the Faraj, as they called it, relief mm -hmm. that, that their generation was looking for. And recognizing that my experience taught me courage is found when we can live immersed and aligned with our own values. If we are to believe in justice and peace, and if we are to unwaveringly subscribe to Dr. King's message to us, mm -hmm. that it is injustice and unjust systems that we want to defeat, not people. Amen. Again, echoing what Ali was saying. Amen. I believe the perspective will shift, the conversation will shift, the struggle will shift, and as a result, the outcome will change. So as my Palestinian steps out into the sunlight, I am personally determined to honor my Palestinians on the ground, my dear Palestinians in diaspora. I'm determined to find power in gentleness, to find strength and love, and to find hope in the darkest of stories. Thank you. That's my story. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much, Tufi. Uh, I, we're running out of time uh, because there can never be enough time for this conversation. Uh, if uh, we can bring all of the panelists back up on, on the screen right now, I'd love to just sort of ask a few questions to us all, and you can jump in as you choose to. I'm going to hit Rowan with this first one, uh, though, because I told her I was going to do it anyway. Uh, so uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in the Souls of Black Folk years ago asked, what does it feel like to be a problem? The aftermath of the Holocaust, the resettlement of Israel, uh, it seemed like such a nice narrative, uh, a land, it was said, without a people for people without a land. But there was a people there. And this is the perpetual problem. What does it feel like to be a quote unquote problem uh, in this context. I'll start with you, Rolan, and then please, uh, Siham, uh, Emil, uh, Emily, or Ali, anyone want to jump in? Um, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, for many, many years of my life, I didn't want to be categorized within that kind of framing or narrative. And now I just own it. I'm like, if you think I'm a problem, like, I'll let me tell you the problem and like really capitalize on um, taking space and shifting it and including our voices. And I think for many Palestinians, the reason why it's framed that way is because we're not there, right? Like we're not invited into the circles at the White House or in, in um, many conferences to like show our voice. So of course, if you look at the gen general framing of how Palestinians are talked about, it, it comes with that light. So for me, I just recognize that it pushes me more and more to want to be in those spaces and be a part of the conversation. And I will say, you know, to the Western world, Palestinians may be seen like that, but to like our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, like, Tunisia, Algeria, like they love Palestinians. And I think it's important to recognize that we have allies we ha and friends in the USA. And so um, on the one hand, the Western media may portray us as the problem, but if you look at um, different communities and allies, we're, we're celebrated. Um, and I think we're starting to see that with social media and like influencers and people that are asking us more to be more involved. So I say, those that think we're the problem, they're the problem. Ooh, I love that. Thank you, Sahal. Thank you, Rowan, for saying this, but um, I just want to say that with all this Middle Eastern recognition and celebration comes a lot of expectations. Mm -hmm. Palestinians are a problem for everyone, those who hate us and those who love us. 
you know, that we are a problem for those who support Israel to be uh, uh, autonomous and not Palestine and those who support us to be liberated and have our own state. And with that comes all these expectations, you know? They think of Palestinians as a homogeneous group, which we're not. We don't have one narrative. We have different narratives, depending on your situation, your placement, your every day to day life. And we have different expectations of ourselves. And, and, and I think the position that we were put in by the different, let's say stakeholders, uh, uh, put a lot of pressure on us and sometimes make us dependent on the reactions that we get, whether positive or negative. And I think this adds to um, not only dependency, but to the lack of agency for Palestinians to act. And especially the ones on the, on the ground who face day to day, uh, uh, even when the simplest, you know, going to hospital, I'm, I'm disconnected from every part of my family, only my sister and brother, we live here in Jericho. All my uncles and aunts on both sides, I cannot visit them. They're just an hour away because of, of separation. And I think you know, we have a lot to lose and a lot to gain, but the moment we think for ourselves not to please or to prove a point to anyone, whether supporters or haters. Thank you. Thank you for that. Emily, you wanna jump in? Um, I could tell a small story that could tell people what is it to live like a youth in Palestine. Um, it's a story that happened with me when I was uh, studying back in um, Birzeit University and I had to take the road going from Bethlehem to Ramallah or to, Bir to Birzeit. Uh, the road is usually uh, 30 minutes, but with the, with the building of the separation wall, it has to go uh, through, like we cannot go through Jerusalem anymore because Ramallah is North Jerusalem. So the road is about an hour and with checkpoints because we have to pass two checkpoints inside the West Bank, Israeli checkpoints. Uh, it takes longer that, um, you don't know for how long, it takes uh, two hours, three hours, sometimes half a day. It just depends on the mood of the soldier uh, on the shift on that uh, checkpoint. So one time I was with the, my colleagues going to university and it was the morning and we were, it was the beginning of the week. We were fresh, we're happy. We're just chatting in the car and uh, we were just happy. And once we arrived to the first checkpoint, um, a young soldier, and when I say young, he's just like, he's a child, he's 18 years old. And he just opened the, the car roughly and uh, to frighten us. So we were afraid actually. And he looked at one of the guys and he said, you're smiling? Well, I will teach you how to smile. And they just dragged him out of the car and he was taken behind the bars, he was beaten. And then he came back with a, with a bleeding eye and just, it, we could see that he has difficulty walking and came into the car and he actually was uh, not smiling anymore. Or none of us was smiling anymore. And we had to continue our road going to university and since since then we actually knew the the cost of uh, smiling and this is uh, and and I'm talking about a small incident that could happen to any Palestinian any youth any woman man just anyone who is crossing from anywhere in the in Palestine in the or particularly in the West Bank because there are a lot of checkpoints and this is how this is our daily life Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that frightening and very real, unfortunate story that you shared there. It's uh, amazing that this can happen even in the 21st century. We think we've we progressed so far. Uh, a, a question has come in from one of the, the, uh, one of the audience. Um, Ali, are you connected with Combatants for Peace, made up of former activists and former Israeli soldiers? Are you connected with this organization? And do you do any work with this group? I'm connected to everyone, actually. I, I helped also organization to be established. Uh, I'm connecting also to the good and bad part of this industry in a way. Uh, because one of the big problems here is that we have peace also industry here. It's not just like uh, 
Combatants for Peace, the Parent Circle Families Forum, these organizations that I admire the people and their offers. But going back to your question, uh, Rodney, uh, you know, if we consider to be as a problem, so who's the solution? Who are the solution? And if we are, if we, if we would have been a problem, mm -hmm. uh, so this means that it needs a solution. Because it's easy to judge people, uh, but it's so hard to stand in a just way for every side. I mean, uh, the first step in solving the problem is the description of the problem. Mm -hmm. So before we envision peace, put you know hopes and stuff, let's just describe the problem right. And this description should be based in respecting each, every human being identity on this land. Because without respect of people identity here, you're gonna just create more terrorists, more violence, more and more. And please, if, if people are not uh, part of the solution, please don't be part of the problem. And if you are not part of the problem, try to be part of the solution. I challenge the whole world that there is no people on earth through the, all the history that has not managed to steadfast throw all of these authorities on them, governments, hundreds of years authorizing Palestinian. And we manage to steadfast, we manage also to get engaged with the whole world in a high professional level. We build countries, we build, you go to Hadassah Hospital, the top professors are Palestinian. Hearing Tawfiq speaking, it's the poet of humanity, it's not just humanity. Mm -hmm. What shall we do more to tell this world that Palestinians are your university for humanity? It's not my job to teach my people how to be human. I think the whole world has to learn how to be human from us, Palestinians. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Humanity for me is not to feel sorry about others. A humanity for me is to engage with others and help them, stand with them, to be engaged with your own humanity. All what we want here, we don't want to own Palestine, but we want to practice our belonging to this land in a fashion of dignity. Is that too much? What shall we provide more? Look at these women. I challenge you, within the whole Arab world, you will not see women like Palestinian women. Because I, I, I am a son of a hero. My mother ha has taught me so many things. And I'm a son of a woman before I'm a son of a man. We, we, we give you our hand to the whole world that help us because violence is not in our DNA. Violence is the consequences of suffering the consequences of this daily suffering. We have not been born to kill anyone or to get killed. We want to live with you. We want to build this world with you. We want to partner with you. Don't label us. Don't put us in that box that will just allow others to keep using us as a resource for their own initiatives. We should not allow that, and we will not allow that. We are a free human being who are one day will be free to secure everyone in this land, not just Palestinian, especially Jewish people. And I'm telling Jewish people, Jewish people are not my enemy. Their fear is my enemy. Stand against your fear, not yourself or your identity. We want to live peace, peacefully with you. That's all what we want. And we will be committed to stand against any hurt of a human being. We will take our responsibility against violence, against human beings, I mean. But we don't want any excuse for any extremist to use our people. On the top of that, this excuse is the occupation. We want to end that occupation because we want to free Israel, not Palestine. And not just Palestine. We want to free Jewish people from this occupation. Sorry, Thank I you. just... Uh...
No, no, no. And this is this is where I, I'm about to start saying things like amen and preach, uh, because that was quite the sermon that you gave right there. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, one of one of our, my students, uh, Roger Rizek, uh, asked a question. Uh, he's a Syrian and Lebanese American, uh, and he wants to know what can he do uh, and what can people in this country do to support uh, the larger cause to help un people understand the injustices that Palestinians face. I'll, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Tufit. Well, thank you, Roger, for this question. Um, I, I think uh, the, what comes to mind first is to remember that we're all made of the same, the same spirit. And I'm not talking religion here. I'm just talking about the core humanity. Mm -hmm. And this is what Ali was referring to a few minutes ago. Uh, I know that Rawan was talking about how, you know, the, the Arabs uh, embrace Palestinians. I mean, this is our romanticizing of, of, of history. We all would love to believe that. Uh, the reality is we have a lot of work to do as Arab people to, to spot the light on, on what makes us unique and what makes us the same in the middle of our differences. Um, you know, Lebanon used to be part of Syria. Syria has been through some major difficulties and, and you know, it's become almost like the new Palestine and so on and so forth. The story repeats itself. Um, so I think each of us is called upon to, to look for ways to share that story of, of nonviolence as the only way to solve our problems. Uh, we need to connect with each other. We need to listen to each other. I have to listen to the Palestinian, to the Israeli. I have to listen to the Syrian and Lebanese. And I think it's probably time to stop saying, I am this, I am that. You know, I, I was born there. I lived there. It doesn't mean I am Lebanese or I am Syrian, I am Palestinian. If we start remembering that we're all at the bottom of it, human beings, uh, that's the first place to start. Even among Arabs who speak the same language, Siam was saying earlier, the story of Palestine really is a collage of the stories of every Palestinian. And unless we walk uh, the talk of conviction through empathy and empathy through conviction, we won't be able to take care of these injustices. And like you said earlier about inequities, that comes from misunderstanding the other, judging the other, assuming the other is, is different and there is fear in that difference. So I think that to me is the first call to action. Listen without judgment and, and try to feel for the other. I love that. Thank you so much for that, uh, that general notion. I wanna ask you, I know that we are, uh, we're always running too short a time. There's like 50,000 questions I wanna ask you. But let me start with this one right here and you all can weigh in on it. Uh, if you were given a magic wand tomorrow and you could wave it and fix the situation. What would your solution look like? Siham, let me start with you. Not to, no pressure or anything. Yeah, well, it's, it's a very hard question to ask a Palestinian. I mean, we, we're the worst planners. We cannot plan, you know, because we don't know what's oh, happening what? tomorrow. <laughs> You know, so uh, and, and I found out this while working with a German organization, they asked me to plan my holidays. You know, it was really hard for me because traveling is such a pain and it takes so much time that I decided not to travel. This is one example. But if I had a choice, honestly, I would flip the pyramid, like get rid of all the structures that are here. Mm -hmm and have the people have a saying in what, what they decide what goes on in their lives, not an elite of people with specific interests. I wanna give power back to the people here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you, Ruan, well, I'm gonna just jump, I'm just gonna throw throwing people into this conversation. What do you think, your magic wand? Um, my magic wand. I, I also wanted to just note to what the American audience can do in relation to Palestinian rights or the Palestinian people. Call your Congress member. Tell them that you care about the Palestinian plight. There are lots of legislation out there and you can be an active role in shifting policy that's more 
pro-Palestinian, pro-peace. If I had the magic wand, I would be very similar to Siham. I would be like, okay, we're just gonna erase, <laughs> we're just gonna erase a lot of the structures that are in place. Um, but in terms of for, you know, for talking about like actual guidelines, I would love to see a Palestinian state with um, a democratic process. I want a woman prime minister. The time has come for women to get into the table when it comes to building Palestine. I think that was what was missing decades ago and that needs to happen um, for the future. And I could, would see um, a unified Palestine with the Arab world, like uh, Tawfiq was saying, kind of increasing and really working on relationships with the Arab world and having, yeah, a state with West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, land swaps that kind of connect all of us together in a continuous um, spot. And yeah, and just giving power to the younger generation to really take that on with allies in the international community. Love it. Thank you so much. Emily, I'm going to throw you under the bus at this point. Well, asking this question, oh, uh, the girls have said a lot, and I do agree with them with like almost everything they said. And I would like to add on it that Palestinians have never had the chance to rule. They've been always ruled and controlled from someone going back to the Ottomans, the British, and even before the Ottomans. And there were always someone dominating and the, the people themselves, they never had the chance to govern their own country. They always had to fight that they even, some people just lost this belief that we could have a state and where could the state be or how could it be uh, structured. Uh, but what I believe in is wh however and uh, whatever the state could be, there should be uh, human rights. This is the most important thing for me, whether uh, we live, uh, it's a two state solution, whether it's a one state solution, whether we build a Palestine in, in the sky, we have to have uh, human rights because like this, this is the first thing and I, um, I insist on it because uh, we're lacking it here. And uh, honestly, I, I like this question and I wanna throw it to Ali because he has, um, he has the, um, I, I would like him to talk about the charter of Tahrir movement that is, uh, that could be uh, a possible solution for Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I, I'll call you my co-host from here on. Uh, thank you, <laughs> um, Ali, please. You know, I always say that we are like, Israelis and Palestinians like are, are two couple in one home. In one, in one hand, they are not married. It's not the one state. On the other hand, they are not divorced. It's not the two state. So what, what, what model that you create here, I think we should separate in the same home without being married in one state and without being divorced totally into state, because we need each other, we develop each other, we help each other and we secure each other. This is the ideal, you know, in fantasy. Practically, I want to see a generation that Tahrir now is working on that are able to answer Siham or to respond to what just Siham said. I want to design a plan and make sure that this plan, I can practice it. I can do it. I want to decide a holiday, and I'm sure that I am going to have this holiday. And, and for me, this is a big achievement with one thing that, I, you know, I don't invest so much in the vision itself. I think the way to that vision is more important to be discussed than the vision itself. Because when you change behaviors, you start building and achieving your vision. And you are not dreaming anymore. You are practicing that dream. Because someone said, dreams is not just something that we see when we sleep. Dreams is something that doesn't make you sleep until they become true. So we dream at the day, not just at night. For the charter, thank you, Emily, for the charter, I would handle it to Tawfiq because Professor Tawfiq helped us a lot to develop that charter. If you please, I mean, I, I make your button, uh, Father Rodney. <laughs> well, thank you, Ali. And, and thank you for the opportunity to engage with Tahrir and, and 
provide some support. Uh, the inspiration is, was there in the movement. You know, it is said that we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And this is, I think, the issue at the core of everything we experience as people. The conflicts between us, the conflicts in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, among nations, it's really all about the conflict inside of us. The fear we experience that we cannot express, the fear of the other, the judgment, how we project onto the other. We've seen it in politicians, we've seen it in militaristic activists. And somewhere inside of us, we have something very precious that if we're able to be in touch with that core humanity of who we are as people, we see it in the other, the pain that we experience, the other experiences. And I think this is at the core, if I may say, of this movement that Ali and, and his colleagues and friends are, are uh, you know, providing and, and leading. This, this belief that we are able to be in touch with that human element inside of us and be able to walk on a path of nonviolence and make that a commitment, a practice, a philosophy, a principle we live by. And to believe that through it, we can really get to the other side stronger and whole. And I think this is the what the charter is urging, that the Palestinian people have the ability, the capacity and the will to, to, to determine their own destiny. Again, not because they have a certain vision of a system or a process, but they're saying we will take nonviolence and put it into action in everything we do. We bring it into our communities and we live by, by its ideals, day in and day out at any cost. And the charter is an invitation to Palestinians in Palestine and in the diaspora and to all friends of Palestinians to, to, to take on this notion that has been around for years and decades and bring it to finally help deal with this conflict that has become synonymous of a cause which I'm afraid the world has been slowly forgetting or has been cajoled into forgetting. The charter and the movement are basically saying to the world, you cannot forget us because we have something to contribute and we're gonna try to model how nonviolence in action can change the reality on the ground. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful questions, wonderful responses. I say, how am I see you, please? I just maybe you want to address, I think I saw a comment mm -hmm. about how some Palestinians choose to take the other way, not our way. And I would just say that as we invite people to see the humanity of others, we also are ourselves invited and committed to seeing the humanity of our brothers and sisters, even if they choose to act upon their love for Palestine and their way of freeing it in a different way. Maybe that does not agree with our values. And someone I really uh, admire said once that in, in, the, in the attempt to create friends, don't create new enemies, you know, even from your own people. And I would really call for us to have the acceptance and tolerance to our brothers and sisters of different values that are Palestinians in different situations would have different choices. For us, it's just creating the space, the option, a different option than the ones on the ground. Um, and I just wanna, last thing, if I may, um, people like ask or expect of the Palestinians to take a swim to shore, you know, arrive at shore safely, non-violently, you know, in the best way they can. But how can you do that if you have someone always pressuring your head to go underwater? And I think with us Palestinians having this continuous trauma, continuous practice of the occupation, that we live day after day, it's depriving us even in a space like this, a safe space where we can express our values and aspiration and hopes. We're put back to the, our daily lives, which you know, rocks the core of our values sometimes. So I would allow for a lot of tolerance for people on the ground. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your comments. I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask for one minute responses, 30 second responses from each of you. Uh, what's one thing you wanted people to know about Palestinians, uh, but that they're afraid to ask? Give me one thing uh, as a, a concluding statement. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll start with you, Tufi. To me, Palestine has always been, you know, a piece of poetry. And and when people think of Palestine, I'd like them to think of the human spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Emily, we'll turn to you. I would like to say that um, when you think of Palestinians, you cannot, um, you cannot not think of peace because uh, we're the ones that uh, spread the peace to the world. It's like, uh, this is the birthplace of Jesus and the birthplace of all the Abrahamic religions. We cannot have uh, not peace in here. We're the ones that diffuse it to the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that uh, reinterpretation that's often missed in the Christian West. I don't know how, but it's often missed here. Thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, Siham. Yeah, I would second what Emily just said. And I would say just one thing. Palestinians were occupied because of their hospitality. And maybe if they were violent enough, they wouldn't have been occupied. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rowan. Um, kind of, yeah, kind of backing on what Siham said. Uh, when you think of Palestine, I would say, think of your grandmother. When you visit her, she will fill you up until you feel like a fat cat that needs to like lie on your back. Um, so think about your grandmothers and like hosting you and food and just a joyous time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll end with you, Ali. When you think of Palestine, Think about humanity. I, I think this word humanity, because you know, we mentioned here Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus because I think he was a non-violence leader also. I mean, here humanity decides the relation. The other thing is it's easy to take sides always because we would like to take sides. Please be pro-solution. I just have a note here in the conversation from Beit of Hope. Beit of Hope is a Swiss organization who stand in, endless to support a year that has Jews, Muslim, Christian, all together. And for you also, Father, this is the second, second time we do it. Our message here that Palestine for us is the world. It's all the world. So everyone, every human being in the world is welcome. He's part of Palestine and part, and Palestine is part of him or her. We don't own Palestine. We don't want to own Palestine. We want to celebrate Palestine. We want to celebrate this existence. So thank you all for giving us this opportunity to share with you our stories and our, our dreams and hopes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you each uh, of you, Tufik, Ali, Siham, Rowan, uh, Emily. Thank you all for your brilliant contributions. I only wish I had uh, 10 more hours at least to fill with uh, your thoughts just to get us started. Uh, there's so much more we can do with this. Uh, let me say that I hope that you understood what I said earlier on about the importance of stories. And hearing these stories today has really helped us to see, uh, A, there is no one thing that is Palestine. There are different views and different perspectives. B, uh, if any of the visions that you have uh, manifest with your magic wands came into being, there's no one in the world that needs to fear. There's no one in the world that needs to be afraid. I uh, see that the story that you all lift up that we all have heard over and over again today is a story of our common humanity and the need for nonviolence as we work together to foster a better world. So grateful to hear this over and over again. This is work that needs to continue. This is work that uh, is just beginning here. And we hope it will go much deeper. And uh, there are ways that we're going to do that. We're going to talk right now. Uh, we're going to have, uh, as we close out, before we close in prayer, I'm going to have Stephen uh, give us a few notes about what's going on with Tahir going forward. Stephen. 
Um, thank you, Rodney. Um, I am moved and inspired always by knowing all of those people on the screen that you have heard from today uh, as change makers and as becoming the change that they want to make. Uh, with the Tahir movement, um, it is something that is working at the grassroots of Palestinian society, giving people the opportunities to come together in Palestinian cooperation to change the power imbalance for you know, self-development of Palestinians, nonviolent in actions, um, standing up to change living conditions while still under occupation and also push against the occupation. Um, I put in my in the um, um, in the chat uh, contact for me, and I see our colleague Chris also put it in. I'm happy to see that Rowan also uh, put the contact for her organization, New Story Leadership. Uh, please get in touch. We are supporting programs on the ground. We are going to try to develop further programs with Rodney in this in this group. Here are ways that we can be um, uh, reached, and we should get you the 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 Tahir Palestine website as well, which is an incredible resource of information. And so I'm going to quickly put that in the chat. Uh, put that in the chat. And uh, with that, um, I thank everyone and the hospitality that was talked about. I've been so privileged to have been a beneficiary of that. And uh, I think uh, it can be turned into a force to change the power imbalance. Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming up today. Thank you, Stephen, for giving us these ways that we can continue to be involved. Thank you each uh, of the panelists for your great work to lift up a better world and may that world come to be. Let's end with a word of prayer. Holy One, one whom we call on by many names, we are grateful to you today for each other, for sisters and brothers, for those who are like us and unlike us, for those who look the same or different, who call on you by the same name or by another name. We are all yours, all made in your image, all granted the gift of your breath, all living in the midst of your world. Help us to do so in a way that lifts up love, in a way that celebrates equality, in a way that facilitates justice, in a way that all rights might be protected, all lives would be respected. We call on you by many names, asking that you would use us for your purposes. It is with gratitude that we say, a collective, amen. 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 God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you again for the next Dangerous Dialogue. Next month, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about uh, dealing with the climate. And as our planet goes through its continual changes, how do we protect our environment so that we as human beings can persist and subsist in the midst of this world? God bless you all.